Uh, well, good day, church. Uh, my name is Angus. I'm one of the pastors here at Orange Presbyterian Church. And I want to welcome you here this morning uh, and here today, uh, wherever you are, I want to welcome you as we come uh, to gather as God's people and as we come to worship our great God, three in one, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you as we continue uh, walking through this season to continue meeting uh, together online, to continue connecting with each other, uh, continuing to encourage uh, each other in our faith, continuing to support one another as we go through uh, this season together. Uh, We're actually going to be starting a new sermon series uh, this week. Uh, We're going to be starting a series that's going to last through the whole term, and we're going to be looking at the gospel and evangelism. So we're going to be spending the first part of this term looking at what the gospel is, uh, really digging into God's word and understanding uh, the implications of the gospel for us and thinking about this good news that we can be sharing with others. And then we're going to be thinking um, about how we can be taking this good news and sharing it with those people around us in our communities, uh, in our families, with our friends. Uh, So that's what we're going to be doing for this next term, uh, looking at the gospel and evangelism. But as we start our time together, I'm going to read to us from God's Word. I'm going to read from Psalm 67 to frame our minds, to shape our hearts, to get us ready as we come to gather as God's people. So this is Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. As we start our time together thinking about the good news of salvation through Jesus, uh, this psalm speaks about the God who calls all people to praise him, a God who calls all people to praise his name because he is the God who saves. So please join me in prayer as we pray to our great God who saves. Uh, Let's pray together. Our Lord, our gracious God, Our great God, our merciful God, our loving God, our righteous God. We praise your name. We praise your name for who you are. For you are the one who spoke and this world was created. And that the heavens declare your glory, the skies proclaim your handiwork. And yet you are the God who knows each of us dearly. You know the hairs on our head. You know our thoughts, you know our actions, you know our words. Father, you know us deeply and intimately. And we praise you because you are the God who knows, you are the God who sees, and you are the God who has a message of salvation for this world. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the one whom you sent to live, to die and to rise again so that we could live. Who took the punishment that we deserved, who not only took sin on himself, who not only stood in our place, but who conquered death when he walked out of the grave. Lord, we pray that you would help us know you more through the gospel of Jesus. But Father, we confess to you that we so often fail to love you. We so often fail to live your ways. Father, we confess to you our sin. Our thoughts, our actions, our words, our pride, our selfishness, our greed. Father, we confess our sin to you. 
but confess in confidence knowing that you are faithful to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Gracious God, as we worship you today as your people, in our lounge rooms, around the table, as we worship you in our homes, Lord, may you bless us. May you draw close to us by your Spirit. That as we hear your word preached, you would do that deep work within our hearts. So be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Well, we're going to sing together. Uh, We're going to sing together now two songs, How Great Thou Art and Never Alone. So let's sing together.
time now for our kids talk so the boys and girls want to get up close where they can see the screen and see our pictures for today well I wonder boys and girls how are you getting on with all this coronavirus business how are the holidays well it's kind of a holiday isn't it a bit different being stuck at home but hoping you're finding lots of things to do to enjoy yourselves even while we have to be staying there we've got a talk for you today and uh, it's another story from The Lost Sheep, and this one is about Peter the Fisherman. So have a look at the pictures while I read the story for you. Andrew can fish. James and John know a thing or two about fishing. But Peter is the fisherman. Have you seen the latest issue of Fishing Magazine? Yes, that's Peter on the cover again just like he was last month and the month before that and the month before that. If you go fishing with Peter, you are always in for a big catch. But one night, the unthinkable happened. Peter headed out to sea, threw his nets into the deep and waited and waited and waited. There were no nibbles, not a nudge of the nets, not a single sardine, no fish, not even one. The next morning, Peter slowly rowed back to shore. Look, everyone, yelled the boy, there's Peter, the world's greatest fisherman. Hey, Pete, said the little old lady, toss me a whopper for breakfast. Smile for the camera, said the man from Fishing Magazine. Peter said nothing and trudged off to wash the nets. Along came Jesus. Now Jesus can teach. He knows a thing or two about God. Whenever Jesus begins to speak, you're in for a big crowd. Jesus is the teacher man. The crowd grew and grew until there was hardly any room on the shore. 
So Jesus hopped into Peter's boat and kept on teaching. When Jesus had finished, he said, Hey, Pete, let's go fishing. Peter groaned, I'll take you out if you want, but we fished all night and didn't catch a thing. Out to sea headed Jesus and Peter. Into the deep they threw the nets and fish, hundreds of fish stretched the nets until they almost broke. Thousands of fish swamped the boats until they almost sank. Peter was amazed. Andrew was astonished. James was awestruck and John couldn't believe his eyes. This Jesus certainly knew a thing or two or three about fishing. Please go, Lord, Peter cried. I'm not good enough to be in the same boat as you. Don't be scared, said Jesus. You're joining my crew. From now on, you'll be amazed at the sort of fishing we're going to get up to. We're going fishing for people to follow me. So James and John dragged the boats ashore. Andrew tossed the nets aside. Then together with Peter the fisherman, they left everything and followed Jesus. So Peter the fisherman became a follower of Jesus. And with Jesus, he began to tell people about the good news of God's kingdom. And Peter went on telling people about Jesus for the rest of his life so that they could become part of God's family like he was, to know the love of God in Jesus. And Jesus wants us also, we can tell other people about Jesus, tell our friends, our family, that they also can be part of God's family. Let's pray that God will help us to do that. Our Father, we thank you for people like Peter who told others about Jesus. We thank you for those who told us about Jesus. We pray that you'll help us to tell our friends and others about Jesus so that they can know him and become part of his family too. Amen. We're going to read the Bible now, Uh, so please grab a Bible and open it to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to hear God speak to us through his word, and Rob is going to explain this part of the Bible uh, to us. Today, I'm going to read to you from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, starting at uh, verse 1 of chapter 15, going reading through to verse 11. Paul's letter, chapter 15 of Corinthians, from verse 1 to 11. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, 
and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what we believe. Amen. Today we're starting a new sermon series looking at the gospel and how we can share that gospel with others. In our current time, we need to hear the gospel. We need to think about how can we share that good news about Jesus with others? How can we find ways to connect it with our lives and what we're going through in this present time? So I'm going to start us off today and I'm going to be thinking about how the gospel is good news about Jesus Christ. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to look at the Bible together. So let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you have given us the gospel, the good news about Jesus. We pray help us to think about that together. As we look at your word, help us to understand it better. Give us such understanding that it will transform our lives and enable us to share that news with others. Amen. Well, it seems today that we are getting a lot of good advice. A lot of advice about how we should live, how do we protect ourselves, advice about things like how do we wash our hands, uh, how do you cough and sneeze, how do you uh, stay safe, do your social distancing, how do you deal with uh, isolation if you have to go into isolation. All these different things, good advice, helpful advice on how to stay safe during this current time. But with all this good advice, you know, what we really want, what we are longing for, what we desperately need is good news. Good advice is, it's good, it's helpful, but it's good news that is going to change our lives. We're hanging out for good news that the pandemic is over. We desperately want the good news that the restrictions have been lifted and we can get back together again. Good advice is good, it's nice, but what will change our lives is good news. And that's what is at the heart of Christianity. Christianity is not about good advice. It's about good news. Good news of what God has done for us. If all that we had to offer as Christians was good advice, then we'd be not much different than any other religion or philosophy in this world. There's lots of people out there who are offering us good advice, good advice on how to live. Do this, don't do that, this is the way you have to treat other people, this is the sort of things you should be doing, the way you should be living in this world if you want to get the best out of it. But the Christian message is not just another bit of good advice. It is good news about what God has done for us in the Lord Jesus. This is a fundamental understanding that we need to get right if we're going to be able to speak to other people about the gospel, then we need to understand that the gospel is good news of what God has done through Jesus. To help us think about that, we're going to have a look at uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, his first letter in chapter 15, where Paul reminds them 
about the gospel. And I want to particularly focus on verses 3 to 5. I'm going to read those again for you. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. As we look at these verses today, from them we're going to see that the good news is out there, that the good news is in here, and that the good news is for sharing. So let's think firstly about the good news that is out there. Paul says as he begins this part of his letter that he wants to remind them of the gospel. He wants to remind them of that fundamental truth that he preached to them and that they believed and by which they are saved. And so he tells them this is the gospel that he preached. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. See, that message is not about try harder, do better, work harder, obey the Ten Commandments, love your neighbour and everything will be okay. That wasn't the message that he was preaching and that had changed the people's lives. The message, the very core of the message that Paul preached was good news about Jesus Christ and what he had done, his death and his resurrection. Now, of course, Paul knew and we know also that Jesus did a lot more than just his death and resurrection but he's saying at the very core of the message there's this fundamental truth that he died for our sins he was buried and he rose again and these were objective verifiable facts Paul brings together a whole list of witnesses who had seen these things and could testify to the truth of what had happened. His list is quite extensive, though it's not exhaustive. There were others as well. He lists even up to 500 people at one time. This was not something done in a corner, in a dark alley, hidden away. This was something that many people saw and they witnessed. Paul is, in a sense, bringing us his references saying, here is the ones who can testify to the fact of what happened, what I'm talking about here. Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. Now, of course, there are people in every age that don't want to accept the facts. Last week, Angus told us about the guards there at, at, the, at the tomb. They saw the angel come down. They saw the stone rolled away. They saw the empty tomb, but they didn't accept the facts of what they saw. Then they went and told the chief priests all about it. And the chief priests didn't accept the facts either. They made up a story, a lie, with no evidence, and they spread that around in order to try and cover up the facts of what had happened. People continue to try to deny the facts People like, for instance, Peter Fitzsimons writing in the Sydney Morning Herald. He likes to describe God as some sort of sugar daddy up in the sky. They're ready to give you good things if you kind of plead with him. He doesn't believe in the sugar daddy, of course. But, well, I don't believe in him either. And neither did Paul. That's certainly not the God that we read about here in the Scriptures. When we proclaim that God sent his son to die and to rise again. We're not talking about fairy tales here. We're talking about verifiable facts, things that were witnessed by others. It is the good news that is out there. There is evidence to verify these facts of what happened. And that is the fundamental core of the good news that we proclaim. But of course, the good news is more than just out there. It is also good news in here. You see, if these facts were simply things that happened 
long ago, they'd be a fascinating piece of ancient history, but they wouldn't change anything. Where Paul describes these facts as things that actually change people's lives, that change his life and that change the lives of those Corinthian believers and that change the lives of thousands and millions of people through the ages. The gospel is good news that is in here. It impacts us personally. Paul says, Christ died for our sins. His death had an impact on our lives if we will take hold of it. The good news is not just that Jesus died, but that he died for our sins. It's personal. His death can have a dramatic impact on our lives. His sin was about dealing. His death was about dealing with sin and the havoc that it has caused on our world. Now, our age doesn't like to talk much about sin. It's either seen as some sort of outdated set of artificial rules imposed by uptight religious bigots, or it's sort of delightfully wicked, something to actually be pursued. But the Bible's description of sin is much greater and far more nuanced than that. It's much more than just rules and forbidden pleasures. Sin is really about broken relationships, guilt and accountability, shame and defilement, failure to live up to expectations, wrongly placed priorities and dependences. In his book, Evangelism in a Skeptical World, Australian author and evangelist Sam Chan tells of his experience talking to high school students about Jesus Christ. And he found that when he spoke to them about breaking God's rules and living in rebellion against God, that he just got blank looks or rolled eyes as if, what's that got to do with us? But then when he began speaking about shaming God with our lives, about living in a way that dishonoured God, suddenly he had their attention. The whole idea of shame and honour seemed to resonate with these students. I've also found that when I speak about the fact that our world is broken, that we are damaged, that it's not the way it should be, that we're not living up to the sort of expectations that we might even have for ourselves, that that also kind of resonates and connects with people. Tim Keller likes to talk about idolatry. Now, he doesn't use that word when he's speaking about it, but the whole idea that we put such weight and value onto some things that we expect them to fulfil us and to satisfy us in every way. And so it might be things like uh, money or pleasure or career or family or sport or all number of different things that we can make as the one object or thing in our lives that will finally satisfy us. But of course, it never can. It will always fail, always fall short because only God can really satisfy us. These and many other ways are all different biblical pictures and descriptions of sin of what it means to be out of relationship with God, our creator. And the gospel is good news that Jesus has come to deal with sin in all its forms, in all its consequences. But notice here that Paul, as he summarizes the gospel, he says that it is about Jesus Christ who died for our sin. He doesn't say Christ who died for your sin or died for their sin, but he speaks about Christ who died for our sin. Paul identifies himself with the Corinthians in recognising that sin is personal. It affects every one of us, every human being on this planet. This is the key problem that we face in the world. 
and it is our problem. Sin in all its many forms has damaged our lives, made us unable to live as we were designed to live. It has broken us, made us unable to live in the way that God wanted us to and it's cut us off from God and damaged our relationship with him and with other people. It is a huge problem and it is a personal problem. But the good news is that Jesus has done something about that. He died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again, showing that he'd won the victory over sin. Through his death, Jesus took upon himself our guilt, our shame, our brokenness, our defilement, our idolatry. He bore all those things and the consequences of them in his body as he hung upon the cross for us. And he rose from the dead so that we might be forgiven and find new life, renewed life through him. When we believe the good news that Jesus died for our sins, then we are set free. Set free from our guilt and shame, set free from our brokenness, our defilement, our idolatry. Our future is now secure through Jesus Christ. We have a sure hope of a bright future. A future in the days ahead, in the years ahead, and for eternity. And we can start living out that future right now. Paul says that the Corinthians to whom he was writing believed the gospel and it saved them. It brought about a radical change in their lives. They were restored in their relationship with God and that enabled them to live new lives. It was a change that worked in them and a change that worked through them to others that they impacted as well. This is personal. The gospel is good news about an objective fact of what God has done that changes our lives. Have you experienced that change by putting your faith in the Lord Jesus who died for your sin and rose again? But of course, the good news is also something that you want to tell others about. You see, finally, good news is for sharing. Paul passed on to them what he had received. He experienced that life-changing good news in his own life and he passed it on to them so that their lives would be changed too. You know, when you have some really good news, you want to share it with others. Our daughter was born at half past 11 at night and uh, when I finally got home from the hospital, it was about two o'clock in the morning and I needed to tell somebody about this great news. So I phoned up my parents and I phoned up Pam's parents and uh, they didn't mind being called at two o'clock in the morning to hear good news. They were delighted to hear that new good news. As it turned out, that next morning was, in fact, a Good Friday. And so uh, after a few hours of sleep, I was back in church and uh, I was there sharing the good news with everyone there, that this wonderful little baby that had been born. Good news is for sharing. I'm sure when the good news finally comes through that the pandemic is over, that the restrictions have been lifted, we're going to want to talk about it. Talk about it to anybody we see. Say, isn't it great? You hear the news. We want to share that good news. The early Christians, when they received the good news about Jesus, they talked to people about it. They want to tell them about it. Jesus died and he rose again. It's great news. It's changed our lives. They talked about it. And even when they were kicked out of Jerusalem, because they kept telling people about Jesus, they couldn't help themselves wherever they went. They kept talking to people about Jesus. It had changed their lives and it would change the lives of many others who heard the good news from them. 
Paul passed on to the Corinthians the good news that he had received. He had heard it from others. He heard it from Jesus himself there when he was converted on the Damascus Road. He heard it from Ananias who came to see him in Damascus. And I'm sure he spoke to the other believers there in, uh, in Damascus. He also met with the apost- other apostles later on and they confirmed what he was saying. This was the good news that they knew that they also had been passing on. The good news had been told to Paul and he wanted to tell others about it. The gospel is good news for everyone who will believe it. Everyone who accepts the facts and takes them to heart will find their lives changed through Jesus Christ who died for our sins, who was buried and who rose from the dead. The gospel is good news. It tells us what God has done for us. And because Jesus has come, and dealt with our biggest problem of sin and its impact on this world and our lives and our relationship with God, it means that he also cares about our day-to-day issues. He gives us hope, hope to deal with whatever this world brings our way, hope for now and for eternity. It is hope that is, goes beyond the coronavirus, hope that goes beyond the restrictions and limitations that we have on our lives now, Hope that goes beyond the financial, economic implications of these restrictions on our lives. Hope that when we looked to God, we know that he can bring us through. Over the coming weeks, Angus and I are going to look at different aspects of the gospel, thinking about how does it connect with our lives and our situations here and now. We'll also be thinking about well, how can we share that with us? How can we bring that good news to others that they also will know the hope that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ? These are critical times in the life of our church, the life of our community, the life of our nation, the life of our world. Critical times that need to hear good news. The good news that Jesus Christ has died for our sins, was buried and rose from the dead. Good news that impacts our lives now and for eternity. Let's pray that God will help us to share that good news with others. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you are the God of good news. You have given us your Son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you that through him we have a hope that enables us to endure the struggles of this world and helps us to look forward to an eternity with you. We thank you that that hope begins now as we are renewed in our relationship with you through Jesus who died for our sins. Oh, Father, we pray, help us to share that good news with us. Help us to find ways that we can speak to others, we can connect that good news with their lives. We pray that you will use us to share that good news so that many others might find that hope and new life through Jesus. Amen. Please pray with me. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. When hard-pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings you shower us with every day. Even in a time of confusion and disruption, When we pause and consider what you are to us, we give you thanks. Thank you for our salvation, for the work of Jesus on the cross as he bore our sin and death and redeemed us, giving us new life by his resurrection and ensuring a lifetime in relationship with you and an eternity to come in your glorious presence. Thank you for our families, both near and far from us, who you have given us to love. Thank you for our friends who offer words of encouragement and understanding, laughter and moments of shared reflection or mutual struggle. Thank you for our homes to shelter us, for our work and our ability to work, for food to eat when we are hungry and to bring us enjoyment and satisfaction. I will give you thanks, Lord, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with so much in our hearts to commit to you. 
We need your peace, your love, your strength and your wisdom in our lives now more than ever. Father God, please be with those in our church family as we live with the additional challenges that we face day by day. We pray for those among us suffering from ongoing ill health, that you would provide them with your peace, relief from their pain and medical wisdom and assistance in whatever way is possible. We pray for those who feel cut off from their families and friends and activities which give them joy. Please draw people around them and provide activities so that they may be sustained and encouraged at this time. We pray for those who are busier than ever before, with children at home full time, for who the de- whom the demands of day-to-day life threaten to overwhelm them without their usual support network. Please draw them close, Lord God. Help them to hear the words of encouragement spoken to them. Help them to be kind to themselves and to find peace amidst the chaos. We thank you for the country we live in, Lord, for the resources and infrastructure we have to aid in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. At the same time, Lord, there are so many amongst us who are suffering from unemployment or the uncertainty of stable work, for debts and obligations which they struggle to meet, from the isolation from family and friends which leaves them without vital support. Please, Lord God, be with them and with us all. Give us your heart, your eyes, your words and your enabling to reach out in love to those around us. We pray that our government would lead us with wisdom Thank you for the measures which have been taken to alleviate suffering from unemployment, isolation and illness. We thank you for our dedicated and skilled healthcare workers who are selflessly providing care and preparing for any situation. Please bless them, Lord, and help us to care for them in whatever way we can. Please keep them and their families healthy and well. We pray for our world, Lord. This global pandemic has such a far-reaching impact as it threatens communities around the world. We pray particularly for countries who lack the infrastructure and wealth that we possess, for those countries with struggling economies, political instability or corruption, ongoing violence and displacement, or crowding and poverty which makes social distancing extremely difficult or impossible. In particular, Lord, we pray for Pakistan. COVID-19 has impacted this country already, and the decision of the government to lock down much of the country means that many people who are already poor now suffer unemployment. Please, Father God, give the government of Pakistan wisdom in the decisions they make so that their directions alleviate suffering. Please be with those who have no ways or means to feed their families. Bless them, Lord, and may they know your love and provision. We thank you for the Miracle School with Anglican Aid support who are providing food packs to the 800 Miracle School families and access to safe, clean water and soap to prevent the spread of the virus. We thank you too for their work in translating public health information about hand washing and sanitation into Urdu and providing edu- education to the community to prevent the spread of the virus. Please bless their efforts, Lord, sustain them in their work and keep them well and healthy. We pray too for Vanuatu, Lord. We pray for all those impacted by Cyclone Harold particularly as the threat of coronavirus looms, that recovery efforts can reach people left homeless and without access to food or water. Please, Heavenly Father, sustain the churches there with strength, wisdom, compassion and hope as they embody the gospel of Christ at this time. We pray for the Cook family as they minister amidst both the COVID-19 pandemic and the aftermath of the cyclone that they would bring your comfort and love to those they are in contact with and have many opportunities to share the gospel with those they speak with. Finally, for us all, Lord God, though we cannot gather physically at this time and the absence of a church gathering is something we miss and grieve for, we pray that together we will grow deeper in our understanding of the gospel and its implications for us as we seek to make Jesus known. As a church, Lord God, please let this be a time where we deepen our understanding of the gospel become equipped to share our faith with others, and that your Holy Spirit would do a refining and renewing work in each of us. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Cry out, save us, God our Saviour. Deliver us, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. Amen. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray.
As we bring our time uh, to a close, let me leave you with these words uh, from 2 Corinthians, where Paul says this, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God bless and have a good week and we'll see you next week.